One minute, I'm just uh, starting. Good evening, uh, dear friends, and uh, th thanks a lot for uh, IMA Taliparab uh, branch for giving me uh, this opportunity on uh, such an interesting uh, topic. You might have heard so many things about COVID-19, uh, about the treatment aspects, about the complications, and now we started discussing on uh, post-COVID syndromes as well. So this is a very huge topic. and. Uh, uh, as Dr. Uh, uh, Kiran was mentioning initially, like every day the evidence on COVID management is keep on changing. So where are we standing now? And uh, what are the present uh, way of manage, uh, managing COVID-19? So we'll be going through those uh, things. So before going through that, like uh, in, uh, in Baby Memorial Hospital, we have almost uh, 90 uh, uh, ro uh, rooms for COVID patients and about uh, uh, 10 patients in an ICU. So we have, a, we have a COVID ICU and about 90 rooms. So at a time, we treat almost 100 patients uh, at a time. Uh, and we have started the treatment. Uh, uh, as you all know, initially, the private hospitals were not allowed to treat the patients in Kerala. So we started late. We have started, I think, uh, the periarium uh, and other places have started very early. So we have started very late. We have started uh, in September 1st only. So initially, we started with very few rooms and uh, one COVID ICU. Later on, we have expanded into three floors and uh, we were treating about 90 patients. So the COVID ICU is under our critical care team. And we have ward patients as well. We have uh, almost 90 patients. So that we have divided into two groups, one group from medical and pulmonology team. That is, uh, we have three physicians and three pulmonologists on rotation. They will treat one group of patients and uh, other group of patients will be uh, treated by our critical care team. That is how we treat the patient in the ward. So, so far we have treated 157 uh, patients in the ICU in uh, last uh, uh, roughly two and a half months. We have already uh, uh, discharged 572 patients uh, from our hospital. The data are available in the Jagrata portal. So at present, we have uh, nine patients in the COVID ICU and 52 patients in our COVID rooms. So uh, two weeks uh, before, we are always running uh, full. But uh, last uh, one week, the cases are uh, decreasing in Calicut, Malapuram, and uh, 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 Kannur, I feel. That's why the references are also uh, coming down. So altogether, we have uh, treated almost 630 patients. and. Uh, our death rates are very, very minimal. We have only, uh, we had only uh, 12, uh, 12 deaths uh, so far. So uh, coming to the, uh, the how uh, we, uh, we were preparing for this outbreak, as you know, for any uh, hazard management, we need an elimination, substitution, engineering control, administrative control, and uh, personal protection equipment. So in elimination, we have to physically remove the hazard. So as the COVID is, with us, we cannot remove the uh, 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 the virus from our uh, area. There is uh, no uh, replacement for this assad as well. So what is possible is engineering controls, administrative controls, and uh, taking uh, adequate precautions in treating uh, patients. So the, what are the engineering controls uh, we did? So we have started uh, uh, airborne infection isolation rooms. Uh, physical uh, barriers such as glass, plastic windows, and ventilation systems. We, I'll uh, explain that. So this is how our uh, floor has been converted into a, a COVID ward. So we don't have a separate block for COVID. So the top uh, floor, the eighth floor of the hospital has been converted into a COVID unit. So where we have a entry area, which is called a green area, where the donning has been uh, done. Then after that, we have an intermediate area or an yellow zone where uh, uh, through which we will be entering into the red area where the patients are kept in uh, different rooms and we have uh, general wards as well. And we have 
CAS patients also now 55 uh, CAS uh, patients also we have started. That is ad in addition to these 100 beds. So while and the patient is, uh, patients are having a separate entry into the COVID ward, this we have a separate lift from uh, uh, minus one. That is our underground floor. The ambulance will directly come to the minus one and we can uh, take the patient directly into the COVID room. Then while coming out, the staff members will be having uh, like a, uh, a male and female uh, shower area. Then we'll be having a, a, a dining uh, area for that and a doffing area also followed by we will be having uh, like an exit room. So this is how we have planned our uh, COVID uh, wards. So now coming to the COVID ICU. So everybody is having a confusion like how to convert a normal ICU into a COVID ICU. Ideally, the COVID ICU should have all negative pressure isolation uh, chambers. And uh, during such a pandemic, it's very difficult for us to convert the whole ICU and make uh, different uh, negative pressure cubicles. So we have uh, we had uh, a main ICU and a step down ICU, and we had uh, already four uh, isolation cubicles in those I I ICUs, and those were the areas we were utilizing uh, during the Nipah outbreak, and we were treating the normal patients also in the same ICU. So this time, as we had uh, different uh, guidelines, we started to uh, develop a separate ICU. So we we had a neurology ICU, so that has been converted into a COVID ICU. So what changes we made was, so we we are having uh, like a, uh, a, we made two isolation rooms in one side and uh, we connected two exhaust fans and made these two uh, rooms, uh, negative pressure rooms. And we have checked that with the, uh, uh, the smoke test. Like once you put the smoke, you can see which direction the air is moving. So we can just open the door and see like whether the smoke is moving inside. The same way, we have kept uh, multiple industrial grade exhaust fan in the ICU so that the air movement will be always towards the outer side. So altogether, it will be a, a, a negative pressure I, uh, ICU, but it will not be an ideal one. But this is the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the many ICUs have been converted like that. Another options uh, uh, for the recirculating air was to use uh, portable HEPA filters or you can put a HEPA filter to the our overhead uh, uh, air, air handling units, or we call it as AHU. But the, uh, to uh, put a HEPA filter to our uh, air uh, the handling units, the, those motors should have enough uh, resistance and power. So unfortunately, our uh, air handling units were not uh, equipped for that. So what we did was there, was, there were a, a few other papers on ultraviolet rays. So we uh, put ultraviolet lights in the uh, air handling units, especially in the air holding areas of air handling units. And after that, we had these uh, exhaust fan as well, industrial grade exhaust fan. So that will be having enough uh, air exchanges so that uh, the, the viral load inside the ICU will be less. And usually the procedures will be conducted in the uh, negative pressure isolation rooms. This is how we have converted. I have already told we are treating for almost uh, 70 days now. We have uh, treated uh, more than 160 patients as on today. Uh, only one staff member got infected uh, till now. None of the doctors or other staff members got infected, luckily. Uh, uh, this is, uh, and again, we had an uh, intermediate room and definitely uh, uh, like an entry uh, room and a dawning place. This is how we have converted the ICU. And regarding the protocol, uh, I know that it may be a bit controversial. We were also following the state protocol and the ICMR protocol initially to begin with. But later on, uh, like as we started treating more category C patients, we also found that uh, some patients are uh, becoming sick very soon and uh, the anti-inflammatory drugs like the, uh, the recovery trial recommended dexamethasone of six milligram is not enough for majority of the patient. So we were uh, uh, like uh, looking at uh, different uh, protocols at national levels and in the international levels. So mainly the IDSA protocol, then again, uh, uh, the, the, the protocol from uh, US NHS protocols. And another uh, very interesting protocol uh, came across was this uh, Virginian uh, protocol, uh, which is called as uh, EVMS uh, uh, protocol. This is mainly uh, described by the great physician, uh, Paul Merrick. 
so he is uh, uh, the one who was proposing vitamin c uh, uh, thiamine for uh, sepsis so from that time onwards the polymeric was there in discussion in uh, critical care groups so we have slightly modified uh, the steroid dosages in treating our patients which i'll uh, explain soon i'm not going into uh, too much into the theory part of uh, covid 19 as you know this uh, sars cov 2 is having uh, different proteins it is getting attached into the ace2 receptors then the viral uh, replication occurs this is how the things are progressing and regarding the transmission you know there are two types of uh, transmission one is a droplet transmission when the, the like the, the within 1 and 1/2 meters when two persons are coming in contact without mask there can be a, a droplet infection and there can be a aerosol a generation or a airborne spread which can happen up to uh, more than uh, uh, like 6 meters of distance so these are the two ways so we have a, a dro- droplet and an aerosol so the covid 19 is having both aerosol and droplet but this aerosol is basically for a closed space so when you are uh, uh, in contact with a covid patients in a closed space especially very uh, small closed space like our lift etc this is uh, very well possible and in hospital setup uh, like what we found is another out, uh, outbreak point is like uh, the persons when they are having um, uh, food in uh, closed areas so those areas were also becoming the hot spot so what we decided was with the close uh, circuit cameras we started observing all the staff members and uh, such areas where these uh, staff members are uh, like sitting and again talking or having food in closed spaces we have uh, closed all such areas and uh, uh, the the uh, the the persons when they were having food etc the enough distances uh, were allowed between uh, staff members so uh, the basically as you all know this uh, nasopharynx will be having the highest concentration of uh, sars cov 2 uh, virus uh, because this acu2 receptor density is more in this uh, nasopharynx so that is why whenever you take swab you try to take it from the nasopharynx so that the yield will be better and the route of entry uh, for these uh, covid virus is basically through the airway and to some extent through the conjunctiva so there is no other route that is why the people have even started coming up saying that i will examine a patient with only face shield mask you don't need even a glove because if you maintain a proper hand hygiene that is possible but again that is not recommended whenever uh, we are uh, going to examine a patient you should be in proper ppe i'm not saying that you don't have to use ppe but as i've already told if you are wearing a proper uh, n95 mask and a face shield or a goggles that is enough to protect you from uh, covid 19 and uh, regarding the infectivity uh, as i have already told this depending on the ac2 uh, expression the infectivity load of these areas also will be less like uh, you know that bronchi alveolar alveoli bronchi etc the the ac2 expression will be less you will be having more expression in the nasopharynx but during the later stages uh the viral yield will be better from bronco alveolar lavage so if you have a diagnostic dilemma definitely you can get a ball but the uh, the, the chances of aerosol generation is very very high this is very very important uh, we all should learn this thing it's like what is the respiratory viral load and day of uh, uh, symptom onset uh, this is uh, uh, this is from this uh, uh, paper so you can see this uh, the viral load will be highest this blue is for sars cov 2 this will be the pre symptom this is a symptomatic onset pre symptomatic phase after that it can last up to 8 to 10 days so after 10 days the viral load will be very very minimal or the transmission will not occur and the same way that during the history also the days of illness uh, uh, initially the patient will be having fever uh, along with that the cough but the breathing difficulty will be developing only towards the end of first week and the patient will be requiring icu admission at the 12th day and whenever the patient requiring a mechanical ventilation that will be towards the end of second week so this is very very important and i think uh, towards this last week what we have observed is as we started more and more home care and as people are uh, uh, like bit hesitant to do the testing so this week and all what we have observed is the people with comorbidities obesities obesity or lung disease 
they were uh, uh, self isolating in home without proper treatment or without doing a proper testing but later on at the end of 12th or 13th day they were uh, uh, presenting with uh, severe pneumonia so that was not ha happening in kerala initially because we were having a very good testing and again uh, the people were picked up uh, early but nowadays as people are not uh, coming for testing that is a real problem we are facing now so initial days we were never getting a patient with severe pneumonia who is directly presenting to the icu but this week onwards we started getting many patients who are directly presenting from community to the icu so what you should understand is like even if the patient is completely uh, or mildly symptomatic up to the uh, like end of first week later on they can develop a severe pneumonia and can go into complications uh, gattinoni uh, uh, the brilliant intensivist from uh, uh, italy so they have divided uh, the uh, covid uh, lungs into two types one is called a uh, l type where we have a, a very good compliance or low elastance and a high compliance so the lung will be looking almost normal but an another group will be something like our normal ARDS we call it as an H group where the uh, where the compliance will be very low or the lung will be very stiff so these group of patients we will have to ventilate like uh, any other ARDS patient so initial days we were getting a very few uh, L group of patients but nowadays as I have already told whatever patients we are getting in the ICU all belong to this uh, H category with where we have to use high peep and normal ARDS management. So I'll come to that later. And uh, this is very, very important. And uh, as a clinicians, we should definitely understand what is happening uh, to the lungs in COVID-19. So this is called an organizing pneumonia. You can see the peripheral shadows uh, with a thick, uh, uh, the shadows. And here you can see this uh, b b like a ground glass opacities. So in COVID-19, you can get a ground glass opacities and organizing pneumonias. So these organizing pneumonias are uh, responding very well to steroids. So even when the patients are discharged uh, home, so they can later on uh, present with uh, significant organizing room, uh, pneumonia. So those patients who are requiring uh, a oxygen supply during uh, uh, oxygen supplementation during hospital stay or those who are uh, really sick and got discharged. So nowadays what we are doing is we are calling them back after two weeks and we are getting a uh, CT thorax for those patients. So even uh, like almost uh, uh, 30, uh, 30 to 40 patients we have called back and we got the CT. Uh, because of shortage of time, I cannot discuss all the CTs, but the majority of the findings are the patients are having organizing pneumonia and we have to start the patient on high dose steroids and they have to continue on steroids. If the patients are not responding to steroid, we will have to think about other uh, immunosuppressant drugs like Asatoprin or mycophenolate. Again, uh, because of uh, a lack of time, I am not going into the details about those uh, immunomodulatory therapies. So, what are the basic principles of this EVM protocol of uh, management? One thing is regarding the monitoring of inflammatory and coagulation ma uh, uh, markers, especially when the patients are sick. You look at inflammatory markers like uh, CRP, interleukin 6. LDH and serum ferritin. So this itself will give you the trend to which the patient is moving. So especially if the patient is having a significant chest tightness, cough, is not able to talk well, or when he's having a desaturation on exertion, we call it as an exertion desaturation, etc. Along with a rising trend in inflammatory markers. So that is the point where you will have to hike your steroids and you will have to get the control over the disease. So how you are going to make or how you are going to make out that you are getting a control over the disease is you can definitely see the inflammatory markers are coming down. So the monitoring the inflammatory markers at serial interval will give you a clue towards which direction your patients are moving. So you should definitely at least you look at CRP and ferritin and see it to which direction the inflammatory trend is going on. Then obviously uh, the supporting uh, uh, oxygen uh, definitely when the saturation goes below 92. If the saturation is more than 92, you don't have to supplement oxygen at all. Another definite, just like steroid, another thing what I found or again internationally what uh, the clinicians have found working very well in COVID management is early awake prone positioning. We call it as CAR protocol, which I'll explain later. So whenever the patients are developing mild hypoxemia, 
teach them how to do self proning and position changes and those patients who are uh, uh, who are doing those uh, uh, self proning protocol uh, uh, very well or when they are uh, uh, like uh, uh, when they are following our instructions uh, uh, clearly those patients were found to improve uh, improving fast then obviously you will have to uh, manage the hypercoagulability i will come to that later then a systemic steroid other antivirals we will come to that later so these are the clinical phenotypic of patients like we had asymptomatic patients mildly symptomatic patients thrombophilic patients early pulmonary phase late pulmonary phase and a late uh, pulmonary or macrophage activation like syndromes so in late phase you can see interleukin 6 uh, d dimer ferritin along with ldh and crb will be very much elevated even in this inflammatory phases you can see a significant rise in crp ldh ferritin etc i think i interleukin 6 level may not be available in all the hospitals but uh, uh, getting a crp ldh and ferritin uh, done in all the hospitals are very easy so this will definitely give you a, a clinical clue that to which direction your patients are moving so this is a very very important slide to uh, to understand the concept of managing the covid 19 you should be very thorough with this slide so initially you have uh, like an incubation period nowadays uh, majority of the patients the incubation period are very very minimal like uh, two to, on an average two to uh, seven days that's why even our uh, uh, the quarantine protocols have been reduced to seven days and doing a test at eighth day uh, it's not an internationally accepted way still internationally the 14 days quarantine is followed but even in our experience majority of the patients are having a very short incubation period so towards the end of the incubation period there will be maximum viral replication and the patient will become symptomatic then gradually the viral load declines then towards that time the innate immunity or the immune response will uh, started increasing and there can be a dysregulated immune response happening so here is the early pulmonary phase so whenever you examine a patient admitted in your hospital the first question you should ask should be like what is the date of onset of symptoms why that is important because if it is within 7 to 8 days of onset of symptoms that means the patient is still in a viral replication phase and there is a definite role for using antiviral drugs but if you are already in a uh, like an inflammatory phase there is no point in using an antiviral drug whether it is a remdesivir favipiravir ivermectin doxycycline whatever it may be there is no point in using that but uh, especially in a symptomatic patient in the early first week especially with comorbidities there is a definite role in using uh, antiviral drugs uh, what we have used so far is favipiravir and remdesivir so remdesivir like i have not uh, analyzed the data in detail and again we have not a comparison uh, we were not having so in uh, the clinical observation what we found that the severity was uh, the coming down uh, drastically and that was been observed uh, in the act 1 trial as well as you know there were two trial like the contradictory trial one initially by the act 1 trial and later on with the the, the recovery uh, the uh, sorry uh, the solidarity trial so which was not uh, giving uh, enough uh, uh, which was not showing Uh, enough advantage with the remdesivir so in our observation also the remdesivir was uh, showing a, a good clinical response in the early viremic phase but you always uh, very clear you should be very clear there is no point in using an antiviral drug after 7 days and after the uh, the symptomatic phase the patient ha- can have this viral debris the viral debris means there can be some viral particles that doesn't means that virus is infective or it is an replicating virus and if you do a pcr test at this point of time that is after 11th day or even if you do an antigen you can get an antigen positivity or a pcr positivity it doesn't tell you that the patient is continue to have a viremia at all and again that is i i i i will say that is not at all scientific to do a repeat antigen test before discharge and none of the uh, uh, like uh, institutions or uh, the, the the main authorities are recommending doing a repeat test so i don't know why still uh, the our state is following a repeat antigen method so you can we can follow the uh, state guidelines no problem in that 
but you should definitely give an assurance to the patients that even if there is an antigen positivity you don't have to treat it with any viral antiviral drug at all and that will never tell you that the patient is going to become uh, more sick or going to develop complication the same way even if the patient is tested negative for antigen at this uh, point that doesn't tell you that the patient will not go for any uh, immune uh, dysregulated immune uh, complications or inflammatory complications and the symptoms also will vary depending on this course of uh, illness so this is the uh, another thing which i have already told uh, uh, this is a infectious pe infectious uh, period that will uh, have uh, start from pre symptomatic period up to 6 days after the onset of symptoms there are enough data to support that more than 10 days the patient cannot transmit the disease at all so but the antigen positivity can last up to 2 weeks or more and the pcr positivity there are data up to 60 days the pcr positivity positivity has persisted so that doesn't tell you that the patient will be continue to be infective the same way you have already discharged a patient that patient is coming for a repeat procedure after 2 weeks and if you do a pcr likely that the patient will be pcr positive again and you cannot uh, deny any procedures Uh, only because the patient is pcr positive and that doesn't tell you that the patient is having a reinfection the reinfection usually happens after 2 uh, two months because your immunity will last on uh, really will last up to 2 uh, months i don't know like uh, we don't know like how long it is going to last that may be so many immunological variation from person to person but uh, especially in a clinical scenario uh, like a patient who is already discharged from the like after covid then coming for another procedure please don't do a pcr pcr test and uh, say that the patient is positive and uh, don't defer any patient for any procedures you don't have to do any test at all for first two two months later on obviously you can uh, think about screening uh, such patients this is again uh, like uh, another uh, uh, paper looking at uh, the infectivity so infectivity how will you say that the patient is infective either we will have to do a viral culture or there is another test called sub genomic mrna pcr where you can look at uh, the replicating virus that is a sub genomic mrna so if you have a sub genomic mrna pcr or a viral uh, culture then definitely you can see that the patient is infective and all the studies uh, con consistently across the world have shown that the viral po uh, the culture positivity la will last up to 8 up to maximum 10 days so there is no point in isolating a patient after 10th day or even after your discharge if the patient meets a discharge criteria that is becoming asymptomatic after 10th day there is no point in keeping the patient for isolation again but as per state guidelines we have to keep uh, the patients for one more week but you should know the scientific uh, rationale uh, behind that i am not going into the uh, other uh, uh, the pathophysiology but Uh, definitely you should uh, understand there is something called an endotheliopathy happening in uh, covid patients like nowadays like especially uh, last two days the medias are also started discussing about these endo uh, endotheliopathy and uh, thrombotic complications in covid 19 so we should we should try to uh, identify which are the patients who are likely to uh, uh, develop more uh, thrombotic complications and we will have to put that patients uh, put uh, those patients on Uh, oral anticoagulants as well now coming to the evidences uh, there are uh, so many trials and again within one hour it will be very difficult for me to go through all the evidences but in short hydroxychloroquine uh, even though we try, tried it for pre exposure for, for post exposure symptomatic and in a uh, inflammatory uh, phase there is no benefit seen with hydroxychloroquine there are few papers showing a benefit with hydroxychloroquine but that is not at all consistent and again not at all uh, acceptable as well as on today uh, uh, with the uh, available evidences as on today so the chloroquine is uh, not at all effective remdesivir i have already told uh, it definitely reduce the time to recovery but the mortality benefit is not sure but especially uh, like in my practice what i started uh, i i was doing was we uh, put the patient on 200 mg of uh, remdesivir on day 1 and we give it up to 5 days especially if the patients are having multiple comorbidities and they are significantly symptomatic with uh, real chest signs and those group of patients we uh, we have observed that they were not going for severe complications lopinavir ritonavir again no uh, data interferon also no data now 
tocilizumab also that that is an another drug which was extensively used i have already shown my data of 600 plus patients i have not used tocilizumab even for a single patient still our mortality rate is uh, uh, very very less so there are ways by which you can uh, reduce the use of tocilizumab or tocilizumab if you want to use it is indicated in only uh, uh, a particular situations which is beautifully uh, narrated in our uh, state protocol as well regarding the convalescent serum that i think that is another uh, uh, the dr- uh, another uh, treatment modality we you uh, misused uh, too much i was also uh, like uh, 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 i was also discussing too much about convalescent uh, serum initially but uh, later on the datas were uh, not uh, very convincing uh, the corticosteroid uh, definitely when you use it in the early phase it tend to uh, 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 it tend to produce harm so if you want to initiate steroid you have to always uh, initiate it after 7 days of onset of symptoms or in the early phase only if the patient is having a pre existing asthma copd etc so this you have to use your clinical discretion but definitely towards the end of first week steroid is definitely effective but in a viral in a replicating phase if you try to uh, suppress the immunity that uh, can definitely uh, produce a ivermectin is having uh, uh, more and more uh, growing evidence but again we will have to wait for more data this is also very very important diagram which i have already explained so the initial phase the patient the oxygen saturation will be uh, maintained so towards the second phase only the saturation will be dipping so that is the phase where we will have to start the steroid and during the late uh, pulmonary phase when the patient is going for more desaturation definitely you will have to hike the steroid dose or hike the anti inflammatory treatment and this viral replication phase or early symptomatic phase up to first week of illness this is the only phase where you will have to uh, use the uh, uh, use the antiviral drug and the as the inflammatory response in the initial days will be minimal there is no point in using a steroid during the early phase of illness the regarding the dose of steroid there are multiple uh, data and multiple studies but i do admit that uh, the uh, the definite study that is a recovery protocol has looked at uh, low dose steroid of uh, 6 mg per day uh, only but there are many other datas now evolving uh, looking at higher doses of steroid especially in those patients with uh, 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 a creeping trend on uh, inflammatory markers so this is uh, uh, with the uh, uh, another uh, uh, use of high dose steroid especially when the patient is developing macrophage activation syndrome you all will be knowing what is macrophage activation syndrome or the patient can develop something like a cytokine release syndrome or crs the macrophage activation syndrome or macrophage activation like syndrome you can diagnose uh, using a scoring system called h score i am not going into the details those, those are interested you can see what is h score and there are online calculators of h, h score as well so whenever this h score is more than 169 then definitely there is a chance that the patient is in macrophage activation syndrome and you will have to use higher dose of steroid something like methyl prednisolone of 125 mg 8 hourly and this year another thing what we have observed is the incidence of macrophage activation syndrome in rickettsial fevers especially scrub typhus is also very high the last uh, two weeks we have uh, received at least uh, two patients from uh, telcheli area with uh, uh, like a non specific fever respiratory symptoms initially mimicking a covid later on thinking like an lepto but uh, with a uh, uh, late uh, like uh, when we evaluated in detail the even the scrub antibody was uh, positive so definitely there are many cases of scrub and leptospirosis also overlapping please don't uh, miss such cases uh, the clinical heterogeneity definitely the inoculum size is very important especially when you have a, a significant exposure to the virus like when you do a, a, a like aerosol generating procedure without proper precautions or uh, 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 like uh, the age sex obesity etc definitely uh, the the chances of complications will be high the patients with the vitamin d deficiency also found to have more complications diabetic cardiac disease patients on uh, multiple antihypertensive 
uh, etc also found to have more complications so the vitamin d uh, uh, like for all patients even for a uh, prophylaxis you can supplement uh, 60000 unit uh, weekly once you are not going to lose anything the same way the patients with comorbidities you have to observe them closely they are likely to develop they may be asymptomatic for initial 7 days but they are likely to develop complications towards the end of 10th uh, day so this is the uh, uh, the placid trial our icmr trial on convalescent era i know that we all uh, initially uh, 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 were discussing too much about uh, the plasma therapy but as the data was published from india it was showing that it was not at all showing any reduction uh, in the progress of covid uh, 19 at all this is a icmr data which was showing that the the plasma treatment was completely useless that is why there is no point in continuing with plasma treatment yes you can try, try still use uh, you can try a, a plasma but there are two uh, definite uh, uh, the, the conditions which icmr was also proposing or this plasma trial group was proposing one thing you have to definitely look at neutralizing antibody and make sure that the donor is having enough neutralizing antibody so without looking at a neutralizing neutralizing antibody titer there is no point in taking plasma and giving it for the uh, uh, the for a patient and looking at antibody titers at, uh, by looking at elisa or some other method will not tell you that the patient is having a neutralizing antibody second thing is like towards the end of first week the patient will started will start developing antibodies in their body so once the antibodies are already formed there is no point in uh, administering an antibody from outside so towards the end of first week you should never give plasma therapy at all so if you give more antibody so that is the point where the patient will be developing complications because of dysregulated immune response so if you give more and more antibody that will be producing more uh, immune related inflammatory problems and that will be uh, increasing the mortality so even if you want to use a plasma that should be used before a uh, uh, first week where the patient has the patient has not developed enough antibodies in their uh, uh, in their blood so you have to check whether the patient has not developed uh, 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 like antibodies and the donor is having enough uh, neutralizing antibodies without those two there is no point in continuing with uh, plasma therapy and regarding the oxygen treatment everything uh, i will come to that uh, uh, in detail so uh, how we will uh, uh, start the oxygen therapy uh, this you should be very clear so initially we can start with a nasal oxygen where you can give up to 3 liters then you can uh, increase into the uh, the face mask then we can use this uh, venturi mask where you can put uh, the how many how much percentage of oxygen is required if the patient is still hypoxic you will have to use a non re uh, non rebreathing mask where the inspired uh, oxygen concentration can be increased so uh, from this point onwards you can start using humidified oxygen through this uh, high flow nasal cannula as, as well so majority of our patients have recovered or done very well with hfnc so i think uh, our all unit should try to procure more hfnc and we should learn how to use uh, hfnc as well so what is the, uh, the this is the way we usually give oxygen so what is the problem with the uh, normal nasal oxygen so when we give a normal oxygen so it will get diluted with the oxygen uh, which is which we are uh, atmospheric air which we are inhaling so the the given oxygen will get diluted so that is a problem uh, with uh, uh, with the normal oxygen but when you give a high uh, uh, flow oxygen through this hfnc definitely this dead space can be filled with the oxygen given through this machine and you can give a higher concentration of uh, humidified oxygen so we can uh, give a respiratory support uh, airway hydration and the patient comfort also will be better with high flow nasal cannula so you can supplement oxygen you can have a dynamic uh, positive airway pressure or you can have a peep effect the same time you can have a reduction in dead space also this is the the the, the physiological mechanisms how how this hfnc will be helping and patient will be very comfortable on hfnc as well but whenever you put an hfnc you should know the patients are not going for higher uh, level of uh, fio2 and again this uh, hfnc also will be having a, a peep effect and a, a very good uh, mucociliary uh, reduction uh, clearance as well whenever you start the patient on uh, hfnc you have to see the heart rate is coming down the respiratory rate is settling the oxygenation is improving in 10 to 15 days and the patient sorry 15 minutes 
and the disney is also improving and again the the retraction or the usage of uh, uh, the accessory respiratory muscles is uh, decreasing and this thoraco abdominal uh, asynchrony is also uh, decreasing so you have to clinically observe whether the patient is uh, tolerating or not so like reduced respiratory rate improved oxygenation reduced bulk of breathing and increased end expiratory lung volume so these are the main methods and the, the flow usually the patients with a, a, a ARDS we use a higher flow some somewhere around 40 to 50 liters but whenever you go for a higher flow the chances of aerosol generation will be high you should be very careful about that but for a covid patients you will have to start with at least 40 liters of, of flow i feel and the fio2 you have to adjust with the oxygen depending on the spo2 so whenever your fio2 requirement is going very high more than 60 percentage or you have to definitely reassess the patient and if indicated you will have to tube that patient so these are the comparison like the comfort level the uh, the, the airway uh, clearance uh, then again uh, the airway hydration etc will be better with uh, these uh, uh, high flow nasal cannula device so now coming to the peep so when you are going to use a, a non invasive ventilation or like what are the group of patients or which are the group of patients who are going to uh, benefit with uh, uh, niv over uh, high flow nasal cannula so you can see a group of patients with a very huge uh, respiratory drive here you can see there will be too much negative intrathoracic pressure uh, created or too much stretch of lungs uh, uh, in uh, such uh, some group of patients so the, this can definitely produce more lung edema impaired uh, gas exchange mechanisms and increased respiratory drive which can lead into something called pcd or patient self inflicted lung injury so this should be very very carefully uh, looked at so here when the patients are uh, the airway alveolus are too much stress which can produce uh, uh, airway injury so this uh, 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 this uh, airway injury can uh, damage the uh, lungs and you should try to abolish that so how you can uh, do that like uh, uh, you can put the patient on niv and after starting niv you have to see whether the respiratory rate is settling whether the, the heart rate is settling or other parameters are also improving this high flow nasal cannula when we are using i've already told there is a chance of aerosol generation we will have to use a face mask to reduce the aerosol generation and whenever you put the patient on hfnc you have to uh, train your nurses and junior uh, doctors to assess whether the patient is tolerating hfnc or niv you can assess it by using something called a rox index which is a ratio of spo2 divided by fio2 divided by res uh, respiratory rate so if the rox index is more than five that means the patient is tolerating but if the rox index is reducing to less than uh, five then that means that is a, a patient is not tolerating and you will have to definitely think about uh, intubating the patient and you can look at rox index at the different time intervals like two hours four hours six hours etc and then you will have to assess about the tolerance and again even after 72 uh, hours uh, 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 or like the the if you delay the intubation for more than two to three days by accepting this very low rox index or a high fio2 requirement the chances of mortality will be very very high so this is also a misconcept we all are having if you ventilate a patient you cannot extubate a covid patient at all it is not true you have to try to avoid intubation i do admit that but when it is indicated you should never delay doing uh, intubation for that patient this is how the rocks index is calculated this is from the NEGM paper there is another method of assessing called perk of breathing index where you can look at respiratory rate the nasal flaring the sternocleidomastoid used by palpation and abdominal muscle use these three were given one point and respiratory rate were given uh, like one two three four points if the work of breathing index is more than four that also indicates that the, you are failing with your hfnc or uh, niv uh, treatment okay so now this is a self-inflicted lung injury you can see but this is a spontaneously breathing patient and again a mechanically ventilated patient so in spontaneously uh, breathing patients you can see the lung uh, the, the 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 stress in, uh, induced uh, or, or the volumatic strain uh, in these lung tissues are more and the patient can develop more self-inflicted uh, lung injury so you should never allow the patient for this hyperinflation so this is how you modify your NIV. I think you all are all will be very familiar with that. 
just uh, 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 like refreshing those points you have to always keep a viral filter followed by a leak port here so and again the mask should not have a uh, ex uh, like an exhalation port at uh, this point the same way whenever you intubate a patient prob uh, like preferably that should be in a, uh, a negative pressure room where the airway equipment should be in one side other side the patient uh, the monitor should be there the, the person who is intubating should stand in the uh, head side and one person should be there to give drugs and uh, should be monitoring and the other person uh, should be there uh, to give the cri uh, the cricoid pressure and he should be giving uh, the equipment and the, the person who is uh, standing outside the negative pressure uh, room we call it as uh, call him as a runner and he should uh, try to get the things like if it is not there inside the room so this is how you have to intubate even your ambu bag should be modified. You have to connect a viral filter to your ambu bag always. And the NIV uh, use, I have already told. Uh, this is also we have told. This is a single limb circuit. That's why we should have a carbon dioxide exhalation port here. That is why you have to connect a leak port. If you are using a dual limb circuit in an ICU ventilator in an NIV, here you, have, you will be always using a non-vented mask or a mask without leak. But whenever uh, you use a single limb circuit, you should always use a mask with leak. But here in COVID, you should not use a leak uh, mask. Instead of that, you have to use a non-leak mask or a non-vented mask and followed by a viral filter. Then we will have to, uh, uh, then we will have to uh, uh, put a leak port in such group of uh, patients. So in uh, this is, uh, uh, I'm not going to the details of NIV. So we have basically two parameters, EPAP and an IPAP in uh, uh, NIV. So you should try to give enough EPAP and a minimal IPAP in COVID patients so that the overstretching can be prevented. So that will be our uh, main uh, aim in uh, COVID patients. So, and uh, whenever you use a mask, you have to compensate between the skin background, sorry, breakdown and air leak. You should not uh, uh, put too much pressure that can produce uh, air leak. And there are different modes. Majority of the time, we put it in spontaneous mode or a spontaneous uh, time mode. So this is the esophageal uh, pressure swing, which I have already told. So whenever you give more EPAP, the swing can be reduced. So your P silly or self-inflicted lung injury or hyperinflation can be reduced by using NIV with proper EPAP. So this should be tried whenever the patients are hyperventilating with huge uh, tidal volume. So coming to uh, the disease per se again, I've already told this is a very uh, uh, well steroid responsive disease. It's not like another uh, viral diseases. And even the ARDS produced in COVID-19, whether it is a real ARDS or not, it is too much debated now. Majority of the patients are having organizing a pneumonia, which is very well steroid responsive. And many data are coming from uh, across the globe as well. The patients who are coming back after two weeks are having significant organizing pneumonia requiring uh, like significant immunosuppression like high dose steroid. Other, if not responding, you will have to use asatioprine or mycophenolate. And the evidence for using fibrinolytic uh, drugs like uh, perfiridone, etc. As on today, it is very, very uh, limiting. And the fibrosis part is also limited if you use these anti-inflammatory drugs very uh, properly. So coming to the management part, so what are the prophylaxis what we can try? Again, I'm not going into the papers. I can give enough papers to substantiate all these uh, statements. The vitamin D, as I've already told, it is uh, relatively, uh, uh, or you can say it is a harmless uh, 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 molecule, a 60,000 uh, unit, a star dose you can give. A vitamin C, uh, 500 milligram uh, twice daily you can give. Zinc, whenever you use uh, zinc, high concentration zinc of 50 milligram tablets you have to use. And there are now uh, uh, like evolving evidence with the melatonin. So previously, you know, the mellow said the sleep inducing tablets we were using. So that mel melatonin can be given up to three to six milligram at bedtime. That can be uh, uh, given even as a prophylaxis because uh, it can reduce the severity of disease uh, in patients when they are getting uh, infected. In patients, who are at home with mild symptoms, again, you can use vitamin D, vitamin C, zinc, melatonin. And if they are having comorbidities, especially diabetes, the chances of thrombotic complications are uh, uh, high. 
uh, even though i don't have a strong data to substantiate that but in evms and there are many other uh, groups internationally started using low dose aspirin in uh, such group of patients as well but later on definitely if the patient had only mild disease you will have to stop that there is evolving evidence for ivermectin i have not uh, started using for more patients but a, a 12 mg of ivermectin at 24 hours uh, apart two doses uh, 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 especially when the patients are symptomatic along with the doxycycline are like many centers have started using ivermectin doxycycline combination also but azithromycin is uh, not having much uh, evidence as nowadays now coming to the steroid how to use steroid so I, i've already told when the patients are becoming hypoxic towards the end of uh, uh, second week with uh, more infiltrates in the chest x ray when the patient is having real chest signs and symptomatic uh, like we can start the patient with the uh, dexona 6 to 8 mg iv there is no problem in that but uh, even at after starting dexamethasone the patients are deteriorating with increasing trend in inflammatory markers like crp ferritin il6 etc etc that is the point where you will have to definitely hike the dose of medial prednisolone so what we followed was we have initially started using medial prednisolone 125 mg od so the majority of the patients were responding to medial prednisolone but those patients were not responding with worsening hypoxemia along with this thing definitely you will have to do the self proning so if not responding definitely and again your inflammatory markers of crp ferritin il6 are growing up you have to increase the dose to 12th hourly or 8th hourly so many severe patients we are treated with 8th hourly preparation and self self proning in the ward and even we have prevented uh, their icu admission so ideally speaking when the patients are becoming more hypoxemic you will have to shift the patient to the icu but uh, because of uh, like uh, a lack of uh, uh, the uh, availability of beds in the icu majority of the time we will have to keep those patients also in the ward uh, so we will have to use on higher doses of steroid in that group so even now i have uh, uh, two doctors uh, 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 nearly from your area initially treated with very low dose of steroid developed significant changes in the ct but improving very well on high dose of medial prednisolone so you should never hesitant to use higher dose of steroid if the patients are uh, deteriorating regarding the remdesivir i have already told if this is for the initial phase uh, uh, like especially comorbidity severe symptoms but one thing you have to always keep in mind whenever you are using remdesivir that has to be infused over one hour one hour only like 100 mg has to be diluted at least in 100 ml saline and to be infused over one hour or if it is 200 mg it has to be infused over 2 hours so whenever this remdesivir was uh, 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 like given fast many patients were complaining of flushing palpitation etc so you should be very very careful about using remdesivir and again the the, 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 the especially when the patient is are having mild renal impairment or elevated liver enzymes at least 2 to 3 uh, days interval you have to monitor the creatinine values and you have to monitor liver enzymes as well even a mild elevation in creatinine is not a contraindication to use remdesivir but as i have already told you to start it very early there is no point in starting a remdesivir or ivermectin doxycycline after 7 days the same way you can use favipiravir or ivermectin doxycycline so uh, uh, initially in the viremic phase of first 7 days of illness the patients are having significant symptoms you can either go with ivermectin doxycycline or with remdesivir if the patient is having a mild symptoms but with comorbidities you can start favipiravir that is a protocol what i have followed again i don't have a strong evidence to substantiate that but uh, it I, in my experience i felt that the those were working but i, I do admit that like a single center experience of uh, uh, like a 500 patients or 600 patients is cannot be taken as a evidence but this is how we have managed i mean, i'm just giving our experience and this is uh, the, the car protocol this is an again uh, an internationally accepted one you all should try to do that like and again even if you are getting infected also you should definitely do that initially ask the patient to do the left lateral then uh, make the patient on right lateral and each position should be maintained for at least 30 to 60 minutes and after that the sitting position uh, for 60 minutes then the prone for uh, uh, 60 minutes sorry 30 to uh, 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 30 minutes to 2 hours and 
patients with niv or with hfnc or on nasal oxygen can very well maintain this self proning protocol so any patients on hfnc or on uh, oxygen supplementation you should uh, learn teach them how to do this uh, self proning and they should start doing that the strandel and berg position we have now tried it is a, a bit difficult to do that and this is how the lateral position has to be uh, maintained and you have to uh, teach up and whenever the patient is uh, 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 moving into the prone position the dorsal segments will uh, get ventilated uh, uh, well and again the, di- the 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 compression by the heart will be less and there will be better mucociliary clearance also then there are three groups of patients uh, when you prone them self proning there are responders whose saturation will definitely improve fast but when you supine them again saturation will drop down and there are other group who are persistent responders when the saturation will be improving and again even when you supine them that improvement in saturation will be persisting and there are some group of patients who are non responders where their saturation will not improve at all so while proning you have to train your staff nurses to uh, to monitor them whether they belong to a responder group a persistent responder group or a, or a non responder group this persistent responder groups are uh, uh, are likely to do very well with uh, the prone positioning and high dose of uh, steroid this is uh, another uh, uh, the thing which has to be very very clear when you have to do a ct uh, for a covid patient i think this is again uh, uh, we are overdoing the things so many patients towards the end of uh, first week the patients will be absolutely fine we do a, a ct then uh, we the keyboard word picking all right mas we will uh, we will try to uh, uh, over treat such patients you don't have to treat the uh, ct finding alone in the early weeks but it is what we are trying to do is early phases we try to manage the patient with chest x ray alone we moreover look at uh, clinical parameters oxygen stat- uh, saturation and inflammatory markers and you titrate your uh, anti inflammatory therapy using steroid based on that those patients you discharge on 40 mg of prednisolone per day Or, and then you taper off in the coming day to 20 mg depending on the severity and when they are you have to call them back after 2 weeks then you have to definitely get a ct and look for evidence of organizing pneumonia if the patients are having organizing pneumonia those patients should continue on steroid for at least 2 to 4 weeks and you can see the the, the pneumonias are resolving Uh, like even right now we have almost 30 to 40 patients we are trying to uh, 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 make a data of 50 50 patients at uh, the changes at two weeks and again after after three months so we are planning uh, 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 to look at changes uh, like that so whenever the patients are sick you whenever you evaluate those patients in the post covid clinic you should definitely try to get a ct chest and you will have to look at the organizing pneumonia pattern in the ct and if the patient is are having organizing pneumonia the treatment for organizing pneumonia is not perfenidone or anti fibrinolytic therapy uh, sorry uh, the, the the therapy like like uh, the the perfenidone your know, the, the, the therapy should be uh, steroid itself or if not responding to steroid there are evolving data on using mycophenolate and azathioprine on you can if the patient is having an extensive uh, lesions you can even use pulse dose steroid in that uh, group of patients whenever you discharge a sick patients the patient as i have already told that you should not stop the steroid and discharge the patient the patient should be uh, discharged on oral steroids if the patients are were having a significant disease uh, with a elevated d dimer values at least twice the baseline elevation you have to put the patient on oral anticoagulants so initially how we manage uh, anticoagulants is uh, if the patient is having a mild elevation we put them on low molecular weight heparin once daily dose if the patient is having a significant d dimer elevation with a severe disease like a patient with a severe disease in the icu all patients will be on uh, like a bd dosage of low molecular weight heparin and when they are discharged we will uh, put them on either uh, uh, like dabigatran or rivaroxaban so rivaroxaban usually at 10 mg or 15 mg od and again dabigatran or 2.5 or 5 mg bd along with that you can put them on vitamin c zinc and melatonin all these three, uh, three drugs are also having a, a anti inflammatory property and vitamin c you should not uh, stop all on a sudden because a rebound inflammatory phenomenon after stopping vitamin c especially on high dose vitamin c also has been 
reported and steroids also has to be uh, tapered and stopped depending on the CT clearance at uh, second week. Regarding the post-COVID syndrome, again, a huge topic uh, uh, because of uh, the lack of time, I cannot cover the whole uh, topic. Uh, so the patient can have persistent fatigue, the persistent dyspnea, but the patient with persistent chest symptoms, definitely you have to get a CT. And e along with that, if the inflammatory markers are also elevated, put the patient on steroid. Then other uh, 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 like uh, joint pain, chest pain, cough, anosmia, rhinitis, red eyes, uh, there are many other uh, symptoms, uh, etc. But another uh, things what we have observed uh, here in uh, uh, like our uh, cohort of patients was uh, the patients developing neurological complications. So a few patients were developing demyelination, few patients were developing uh, uh, Bell's palsy. And again, we have uh, three patients now who developed uh, epididymal orchitis in the recovering phase. So those case reports are also there like epididymal orchitis developing in the recovering phase. The pancreatitis is also described. Again, the chances of thrombotic complications will be very, very high. That is why, uh, like, especially if the patients are having uh, like uh, high blood pressures, diabetic, malignancy, etc., you will have to put them on oral anticoagulants, especially if uh, the, the patients were, uh, the patients, uh, the D-dimer values are very high. So initial days, we, we had many patients who were coming with uh, uh, pulmonary embolism, deep vein thrombosis, etc. But nowadays, uh, the incidence of such complications are very minimal because majority of sick patients are discharged on uh, oral anticoagulants. So uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, I was just trying to give you an overview about uh, different scenarios, how to go ahead in managing the patients, what are the available evidence and different uh, clinical situations and again, the post-COVID uh, scenario. I, I, in fact, I wanted to uh, take few uh, clinical scenarios and to show you how to proceed in managing that patients. But again, because of uh, lack of time, uh, like I was not able to include the images and case scenarios of uh, those patients. And uh, among these 600 uh, odd patients what I presented, we had almost uh, uh, more than 20 doctors from uh, Kannur, uh, uh, Calicut and Malapuram districts also the, again, uh, uh, almost four or five patients, even uh, like uh, the less than 40 uh, doctors were also there in the ICU. Likely all the patients have re responded very well with these anti-inflammatory treatment and uh, they're all doing well and um, uh, few of them are still on steroids. Thank you so much. Now it is time for so audience. Answers. There is some questions. Yeah, attendees, if you, if you want. One minute, sir. Attendees, if you want to ask any questions, you can just, uh, there is an option to raise the hand. If you raise the hand, I can unmute you and you can uh, uh, ask the questions directly. Or if you want to add any point, you can just raise the hand. I can uh, unmute you and uh, uh, we can uh, talk. Just to show your hand. Sir, uh, over to Madhavan, sir. Uh, participants, where they have to show the hand? So there is an option, sir, down, show, uh, like raise the hand. Uh, meanwhile, you can, so they can question and answer. There is a, some questions came in that. Can you see that? Okay. Uh, yeah, the, we will start from the question and answer. A patient with ground class opacities in CT, but no uh, desaturation will uh, benefit from po prone positioning. Uh, only for ground glass opacity, I don't think we will have to treat such patients. That is what I was uh, mentioning. We don't have to treat uh, the CT uh, uh, thorax initially, but later on, obviously, during the review. Uh, initially, you don't have to look at uh, CT and decide on uh, the treatment. Uh, if the patient is really hypoxemic or at least the patient should have a significant exertional desaturation, then only you will have to start the patient on uh, steroid. Otherwise, you don't have to. The same way, prone positioning also. Only for ground glass opacities, you don't have to. It is basically to improve the oxygenation. What are the indications for CT scan? Do you have, uh, uh, do you uh, base them on markers or SpO2 or both? Uh, if symptom persists on uh, As I have already uh, told, uh, towards the end of second week also, uh, how we uh, plan CT is like, uh, suppose you have already ventilated the patient. As you know, like uh, when you ventilate the patient, the beaning sometimes will be extremely difficult. Sometimes the patient will be on tracheostomy, 
it will be uh, very difficult to wean those patients even after the inflammatory markers are settled so those group of patients you can get a ct uh, chest to decide whether to continue with uh, those patients or not because some patients will be having an extensive irreversible damage where you can alert the bystanders that the patient can have a prolonged icu stay or the chances of recovery will be less how do you continue steroids after discharge is there any uh, if there is an organizing pneumonia so usually what we do is we'll discharge the patient on 40 mg of uh, uh, prednisolone uh, like if the patient is with significant organizing pneumonia we continue them for 2 weeks otherwise like depending on the severity of one week we'll give 40 mg then taper down to 20 mg get a ct repeat ct after 2 weeks then uh, uh, decide uh, whether to uh, continue the steroid or not uh how long to continue steroids if the inflammatory markers are increasing progressively that again you will have to uh, so how we titrate the steroid is when the inflammatory markers are still creeping up you hike up the dose of steroid and get the control uh, over the inflammation and again obviously other clinical parameters also should be uh, 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 used high dose steroid uh, kindly mention uh, about uh, dosage i have already told and again please don't uh, take a uh, like wrong message that all the patient should be on high dose steroid i didn't uh, say like that if the patient's oxygenation and lung signs are not improving with the normal dose of steroid those group of patients you should definitely use high dose steroid and whenever you use evidences are also lacking like uh, we have uh, as per the evm protocol we were using up to 125 mg eight hourly but definitely you have to look at uh, other uh, secondary infection and you have to exclude that as well if a uh, uh, covid case uh, later antigen negative uh, day 10 developing respiratory symptoms uh, later antigen test should be done no you don't have to do because even if you do a pcr uh, the patient will be positive even now in icu i have a patient who was initially operated for a brain tumor in uh, manipal he had a mild covid uh, uh, during that time now after two weeks he developed with uh, he developed breathing difficulty he is having a dense organizing pneumonia now so we have done a bowel culture excluded other bacterial etiology and now put the patient on pulse dose steroid and we have never repeated a, a antigen or covid pcr for test that patient because that may be still positive among steroid which uh, sub, uh, which uh, preferred uh, uh, dexa or midelpet i have already told uh, there are conflicting data so initially like as per state protocol i think we can start with 6 mg if not responding you hike up to hike uh, with the higher doses of needle petrosrod uh, is a person uh, uh, taking methotrexate weekly 75 to uh, uh, 7.5 to 50 uh, mg considered to be on immunosuppressive definitely uh he has to be considered but what we have observed is like uh, the post renal transplant we have right now uh, like two persons with organizing pneumonia the four persons are already on triple uh, uh, drug uh, triple and and uh, like uh, 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 triple uh, immunosuppressants uh, on uh, like tacrolimus mycophenolate and steroid so those group of patients when they are uh, developing organizing pneumonia we increase the dose of uh mycophenolate is so like usually when they are on 500 mg bd you uh, hike it to 1 g uh, uh, bd along with other uh, slightly high hiking dose of steroid uh you are not using steroid in the admitted patients with respiratory distress if they are within one week uh, of onset of symptoms that again i have already told we will have to decide like especially if the patient is a, a with a history of asthma copd etc Uh, there is no harm in using otherwise try to avoid using uh, steroid in early phases of illness that is what i told i told if a covid patient on uh, uh, on maintenance hemodialysis become uh, covid positive treated and cured that is antigen negative is it safe to uh, uh, is it safe to uh, advise them common uh, uh, pool of dialysis uh if rt pcr is even if rt pcr is positive uh that is again a difficult uh, situation so what protocol we are following in, in our institution is uh, like even after one week of discharge these patients definitely will be having antibody and the, so those patients will be uh, dialyzed in the uh, covid area itself 
after one week we will not repeat a test uh, so like uh, we will be uh, doing uh, the dialysis with the common area we never had any problem but after discharge after meeting the discharge criteria uh, uh, like uh, we will be uh, dialyzing them in the either in the covid icu or uh, covid dialysis room how many days high uh, uh, steroid is given uh, like i have already told we are having many patients in follow up uh, like uh, i have already uh, told like we have tre started treating the patients almost uh, 60 days uh, or like uh, 40 to 50 days before so the long term data like we don't have right now high doses required uh, tapering while uh, 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 discontinue that depending like if you are using uh, for a longer time definitely you will have to taper and stop have you observed any signs of uh, visible to uh, observed any signs visible to naked eye uh, in skin so many patients are uh, developing uh, uh, rashes other than that uh, i have not observed like if anyone else has observed any skin signs uh, please uh, elaborate on that i have uh, sorry i have never looked at that and any dermatologists in this group uh, they can uh, elaborate uh, on the skin manifestations post covid treatment uh, 10th day after discharge patient complaining of dyspnea CT test normal, whether justified in repeating an RT-PCR. I don't think uh, we have to repeat an RT-PCR. You have to find out what is the cause of dyspnea. The first thing should be you get a CT, see the lung fields are normal. Then obviously you will have to look at other possibilities like pulmonary embolism. If the patient is having a features of uh, like an RIRV dilatation in echo, etc., you will have to get a CT pulmonary angiogram. Uh, my experience on reinfection i have seen only uh, one case so far like this patient was treated in gulf came back uh, 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 here after two months uh, he developed fever breathing difficulty again his pcr was positive uh, so only one case i have seen uh, like our treated group of patients have not i don't know like we'll have to wait again whether they are developing reinfection or not we have a patient on hfnc past three weeks still saturation maintained with uh, FiO2 70% with uh, flow of uh, 40 uh, liters per minute. Whether to discontinue high dose of IV steroid for this patient, uh, D-dimer and ferritin have, uh, has come down. So I think the, those group of patients, we will have to continue with high dose steroid. But what I've observed is those patients who are continue to, uh, 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 continue to have a high oxygen requirement like FiO2 more than 70, et cetera, ultimately they will uh, 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 develop respiratory failure or it is very difficult to rescue those patients. So these group, these group of patients, either we will have to uh, uh, ventilate early or it's, uh, once the changes are uh, already established, you can get a CT and see how the lungs are. If there is a significant changes already happened to the lungs, it's very unlikely that they'll recover. There are, uh, Madhavan sir, Sir, can I take other questions also or? Sir, you are muted, sir. Madam, sir, you are muted. Yes, is, if there is any question, anybody from the floor? Yeah, the floor, I think nobody has raised the hand. But uh, in the chat, then there are will... other questions also, sir. I'll just... Uh... See the chat. Chat, I don't think there are questions. When do you take CT, which we have already uh, uh, discussed all those things? Other points, I think, uh, almost all points, I think we have covered, sir. Eye symptoms are like conjunctivitis and red eyes we have uh, observed in uh, many patients. What about, can you please specify if diagnostic criteria of reinfection? Is it... Uh, Attended? There is no diagnostic criteria as such, sir, but as I have already told, like after uh, two months or a, but, uh, like, at least uh, uh, like uh, three, four weeks, if the patient is definitely having uh, repeated symptoms, we will have to uh, evaluate those patients. It should be a fever with all other symptoms. Only by looking at CT changes, we cannot diagnose. And even if the PCR is positive, that can be an inflammatory response alone. Any, anybody any from the floor ask any questions? 
i think many clinicians are there in the group who have uh, treated uh, much more patients than uh, what i have treated yeah. especially clinicians from pariyara medical college i think uh, one center with uh, maximum number of patients so any yeah, other yeah. points uh, to be or clarified yeah. i think uh, matthew is that dr manu i ask you to just to see dr manu please raise you. please raise your hand we can unmute so so want to Meanwhile, can shall I ask a question, sir? Yes, please. Yeah, please. Please ask. Bino, please ask. Yes. Yes, sir. I have a question, uh, sir. Uh, uh, specialties like uh, gynecology and what, um, and any surgical cases. If they are to operate. Elective uh, surgeries, uh, they demand for RT-PCR results. So if, if it is, even if they have become positive and become RIT negative, uh, many surgeons demand fresh uh, RT-PCR testing. So what's your no, that's, opinion on that? That cannot be understood. I think uh, we will have to definitely educate our surgeons. Okay. I'm uh, saying about recovered COVID okay. patients. Okay. Otherwise, yes, okay. there is no doubt. Like at present scenario, we have to get a COVID uh, PCR uh, done for all patients coming for procedure. But recovered patients, if they are coming for any procedure within two months of time, I don't think we will have to repeat a PCR and see they are PCR negative. And majority of the P patients, if you do a PCR, uh, like they will be PCR positive. And there is no point in referring any procedures. So in our hospital, we have uh, made clear cut guidelines that uh, the, the PCR should not be repeated for hospital admissions if they are coming for other symptoms after discharge. Muhammad Mushtaq, okay. do you have any question? Any comments? If there are no more questions, I think we will wind up the session. I Request Dr. Bino Jos to have a vote of time. Jos? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, sir. You are uh, audio quality? Uh, Dr. Anu. Please tell. Am I audible? I will tell the what Yeah, now you're audible. Uh, my dear friends and uh, IMA leaders, it was a pleasure with uh, Dr. Anup Kumar who covered almost all the uh, details of COVID-19 and they updated us. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Anup Kumar, Anup Kumar for giving this wonderful talk. Thank you very much for giving us the webinar platform. All IMM members are indebted to you for this. I th Sri Krishna Kiran, President, for inaugurating the session. I thank Dr. Mohanan sir for giving felicitations. I thank Dr. Bino Jos for felicitation. I thank each one of you from all of the, all over the world to as you are joined to this session. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you all. The PME webinar is stopped. Can I stop, sir? Yes.